question to you all. Um, first of all, thanks a lot for having me to present here at the Job Final Summit. So similar to what uh, Francois said, uh, I think on Monday, um, this is also for me really a quite special event. I mean, the year of polar prediction has been an important part of my work uh, during the last half decade and even more actually, so since 2014. And um, so with this final summit, a big chapter is, is getting to an end. I mean, of course, things are con continuing, but, but still, I mean, this is really also something that is um, very special. And so I'm really glad that I have the opportunity to speak here about um, the CS Drift forecast experiment, which really has been a year of polar prediction team effort. Um, before um, really talking specifically about SITFEX, I'd also like to highlight and thank the work of, of the whole sea ice task team. So SITFEX has been one of several focus points um, that we pushed and, and coordinated also uh, partly through the sea ice task team. So actually back then when Job started, Greg, uh, everyone knows Greg here, so he has been the central figure uh, behind uh, the sea ice activities in Job for many years and, and still plays an important role. Um, although at some point, uh, when, he, when he moved more into open ocean science as well, um, he uh, decided, well, at some point, first he took me into the boat uh, to co-lead uh, these activities. And a couple of years ago, he then um, decided to move out of this team. And then um, we asked Amy Solomon uh, to take on uh, the co-chairing of this task team and gladly uh, she accepted. And, I think we as a team, we have worked nicely together. I mean, you, you know and you see also in, a pr in the program, there are many important uh, activities that have been going on uh, related to sea ice, and, and, and it has just been one of the crucial things uh, to YOP. And, and, and uh, Amy will also be presenting, or has already, I'm not sure actually because I'm recording this, um, um, about this uh, mosaic near real-time verification activities, and there have been a couple of other things that, that we have uh, put some special emphasis on in this task team. During the last couple of months, things have been a bit silent in this team, but nevertheless, I think we have done, done a quite reasonable job in pushing sea ice activities um, as part of YOP. So now let's uh, talk about SITFEX specific this, and we you know, collect this more broadly, and then we, you know, we can start and, and look systematically into how good sea ice drift forecast capabilities are. And we can do so in uh, also looking at short-term forecasts, and we can do this uh, not only for the specific case, but we can do this year-round, and we can do this for many buoys in the Arctic, and that's actually what we ended up doing. So um, we started this sea ice drift forecast experiment. So what is SITFEX in a nutshell? Uh, SITFEX is a community effort to collect and analyze Arctic sea ice drift forecasts at lead times from days to year. Forecasts are made with various methods for drifting sea ice buoys and the Transarctic Mosaic Drift Campaign. And you see also by the logos here and all the, the names mentioned that, that we are quite a broad team really. And many of the people just mentioned here by name um, have uh, put a lot really of effort and work and time into making this happen. And I will, um, I will show you a bit how exactly and, and you will understand what effort needs to go into this to function. Um, in a couple of minutes. Okay, so about the implementation. The original idea was, you know, during this YOP core phase, which was uh, from mid-2017 to mid-2019, we would be collecting forecasts for around about five or so selected buoys of the International Arctic Buoy Program, and we actually started that in June 2017, so that would be the training phase. Then we would have a phase right before the mosaic drift where we would, in addition, target fixed points roughly in the, in the uh, region where we thought Polarstein should be starting, so that for those points we would have up-to-date drift forecasts uh, so that we could maybe optimize the, uh, the guidance where to, to put the ship. And then in 2019-20 we had the mosaic drift itself, and during that drift we wanted to provide forecasts for operational support, and thereafter the legacy phase. And obviously we are now uh, quite a bit into that legacy phase. Um, one central key thing about SITFEX and what I think made it uh, such a success in my view is that we decided from the beginning in a very useful format how to, um, how to um, organize the forecast and in what format specifically to, uh, to put them. 
So here um, you see, so if you ignore the first five rows, uh, this is actually the part of the files that the different groups would generate in order to submit a forecast. So there's a group ID, a method ID, a target ID, um, then you have the initial time, you have the initial location, and you have an ensemble member number associated with each file. And then you would just have a table with, with the time and uh, geographical coordinate information. So this is just a trajectory. And if you have an ensemble forecast system and you submit several such uh, forecast members, then you could just do that and you would have different uh, different uh, versions of that with a different uh, ensemble member number here. Yeah? And there was also an associated uh, file naming convention. And so what we also needed was an infrastructure obviously around it. So they, you know, if people would have started and sending me this by email, obviously this would not have worked. So um, we put up an infrastructure on the, on the German Climate Computing Center with a cloud service there. And so groups uh, could um, use the information about the different targets that we have and where they most recently have been uh, on a website that is automatically updated um, on an hourly basis. Now the different groups could, uh, could use their table and then use their own forecast systems that are running anyway and then they put tracers in there or um, uh, yes they put tracers in there uh, in order to generate a forecast based on the drift fields that ha they have in there. And, and so they make this, this SIDFAX format out of that. They, they would push their forecast files onto this uh, cloud service and there would be an automatic format check and, and this header that you saw earlier will be headed which documents when this file arrived and when it, it has been processed. And then uh, this would all make it into an archive and into a data index and this would also right away on an hourly basis uh, be updated uh, on this cloud service and made uh, openly available uh, through various um, means. And, and this system uh, has been put in place in 2017 and is still running today. And today, on a daily basis, we are, we are still receiving from, from, from half a dozen operational centers uh, these forecasts. Um, and these are the centers that have been contributing since. <coughs> Sorry. So here are some statistics. So this is a map view of, of um, how many forecasts in, in the different regions of the Arctic are in our database. Now this is only looking at um, all forecasts that have been, uh, that are valid uh, all the way to 2020. So here actually one and a half years missing. Um, and you see that we have quite good coverage across the Arctic. Um, and you, you can also look at that in a, in a bit more detail. So if you look at the, in, in the top row here, you have the initializations by season. Um, so, so no systematic difference here. Uh, in, in the bottom row, you have the initializations by year, and and um, something here that is obvious is that 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 the um, that the density of data has increased. So we started with just a few targets in 2017, and this has become a bit more. And also the coverage is a bit better. Um, and also what you see if you look closely, for example, here in 2019. Uh, you have here this very data rich region and that's actually the beginning of the mosaic drift and then in 2020 it's this part here so so the later part of the mosaic drift because there uh, what we also added as targets is not just um, Polarstern itself but also this distributed array network around Polarstern uh, because we wanted to have that in order to do some analyses about whether or not uh, the forecast systems have any skill in forecasting the deformation of the sea ice. Okay, and, and um, I will show something about that later on as well, although I can just tease out that actually. Okay, uh, statistics here as time series. So here we present this as the number of forecasts per target uh, for the different years. And you see uh, in black all forecasts, uh, in red you see them uh, only those with, uh, which are near real time, so with a delay of less than two days. And you see that, that really a large part of the forecasts are arriving in near real time. So, um, so this is really great. And, and we could use these uh, also for operational support as I will also show later on. Um, beside these um, near real time operations, we have also been contributing to the sea ice outlook. And actually this year, um, we are trying to do that for the sixth time in, in a row. So, uh, so now this shows an, an, a part of our analysis that we put into place uh, for the last year's sea ice outlook. Um, 
actually this uh, the plot is a bit busy here so here are the different targets uh, that that we considered for this for this exercise and 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 here's the analysis and basically each of these ellipses is a forecast ensemble uh, which consists uh, depending on the forecast system of of many individual points um, and I have no time here to explain this in detail and I uh, totally understand that this uh, plot is a bit crowded and not, not to understand so easily, uh, quickly. So please have a look at the post-season reports um, where um, we describe this in more detail if you are interested. Um, near real-time products, actually we um, provided those in a number of ways. And specifically what we focused on here is, is a consensus forecast, how we called it. A consensus forecast that we composed of different, uh, of, of not all, but most of the incoming operational forecasts so that we have something like a multi-model um, consensus forecast. Um, we provided that, for example, for the Polarstern, uh, for the Mosaic Drift, uh, a product. Uh, so we sent, we constructed shape files that could then be viewed online on this Polarstern map viewer system, really on the bridge, um, on the ship, and and there's also a land version of, of that system. Uh, we have a graphical product that we generated every six hours. The, these were also updated every six hours, and um, and su such graphical products we provided where you have it as a time series and also here as a map plot. But we also constructed a web tool, uh, and there in particular Simon Reifenberg has been uh, behind the development of this. And um, so, so we also, um, uh, over the years, we constructed an R package where you can really do a lot uh, analyzing all the SITFEX data. And, and anyone, if, if you would like to play with, uh, with the SITFEX data, uh, it's very easy. You can go to GitHub and get this package, and, and there is a, a user guide how you can do things, and of course you can ask us if, if you need any help. So let's see how this uh, SITFEX consensus forecast works. So now um, imagine we have here the observed track. So this is now the x-axis is time in days, and, and, and we have an observed track up to a certain time, and here we wanna, wanna do our uh, initial time for a consensus forecast. Um, and we, we have a number of daily short-term uh, forecasts that, that come in in near real time. We have a monthly seasonal ensemble forecast product uh, that we want to use to extend uh, the short-term forecasts. So, um, so for example, this system has a last initial time, which is uh, you know relatively recent, let's say two days old, and also it has more than three days of remaining lead time range. So we take this one in. We have another system which has a lot of remaining lead time, but but actually the initial time is more than three days old. And so we don't use that because we uh, say, you know, on that time scale, uh, the, the weather forecast accuracy behind it will not be that good anymore. So, so we leave that out in order not to spoil our ensemble. Uh, here is another one with a very recent initial time and also enough remaining lead time range. We, we keep that. Um, there's another one again, which is you know not long enough, and uh, so it, it might be recent enough in terms of initial time, but it doesn't have enough remaining lead time range. So this would also uh, generate problems. So if we start to extend a forecast here with uh, outdated seasonal forecasts already, where we think the weather forecast should still have reasonable skill, then we are um, you know giving away some some potential skill, so we are uh, kicking that one out as well. So we use all that meet these criteria um, and merge them with the ensemble forecast in the following way. So first off, we use these short-term forecasts um, and adjust, we truncate uh, the obsolete part of the individual trajectories, we adjust the position so that the uh, position at the initial time is correct. Um, and then, you know, at the point where these forecasts uh, have their um, longest lead time. Uh, we use the um, uh, different ensemble members of the seasonal forecast system in order to elongate uh, several trajectories starting from there, uh, again with adjustment of the positions, okay, so that the seasonal forecast trajectories are shifted in such a way that, that we, we, in the end, have a seamless product. Okay, now we can look at uh, also again how this looks in action. Now, um, I want to illustrate this here with, uh, with something that we looked at in February 2020 when Polarstern was actually fairly close to the North Pole. And we were wondering how close um, Polarstern would get to the North Pole. And 
Uh, and you see here the seasonal forecasts that, that have been truncated and adjusted, but without the use of short-term forecasts here. And, um, and, you know, using just those seasonal forecasts at the time, it was not clear maybe we could even, you know, uh, go around the North Pole and, and cross the date line. So that was really, uh, it looked like there could still be the possibility of that. But if you introduce uh, the short-term forecast, as we did in the, uh, in the consensus forecast, and that's what you see here. So here, this is the consensus forecast. It's also shorter because it's uh, limited to 124 days. But, but uh, the, the important bit is here, this beginning. So because there is a consistent development over the, over the first couple of days here, bringing uh, the ship toward Fram Strait, and thereafter, this ensemble would not have enough spread in order to allow really a trajectory that would still pass the North Pole across the date line. So, so that's why we um, originally wanted to, uh, to, to have the title for this article that we um, published on the Mea Ice Portal, uh, Farewell North Pole. But actually, we were um, kind of asked to change that title because people thought that uh, sounded too negative. So anyway, now it's uh, a stone's throw away from the North Pole, which of course sounds uh, much more positive. So how good are the SIDFEX forecasts actually? So now we're going into evaluation and verification here. And, and we start by looking at this specific case that we just discussed. And we look at the consensus forecast specifically. And uh, so what you see here is the graphical product of the consensus forecast. And uh, in the triangle, now in the top row, you see the um, short range, the next seven days only. And in the bottom row, you see uh, the next 120 days. So that is the, the range we agreed upon for the consensus forecast, consistent with the length of the seasonal forecast product from ECNWF. Um, in the triangles are the forecast and, and the rectangles are the corresponding uh, observations. And you see also the whole trajectory here uh, in, as the black curve. Um, and also here as time series plots, and you see this was really spot on. Um, and, and actually this is not cherry picked, so many of the, in many of the cases we were really quite happy with the performance, in particular of the consensus forecast. So you see really also the individual systems performed quite good, but the consensus on average really was outperforming, and I will show that also on a later, um, on the next slide. Uh, on the longer range, uh, you see that the drift, uh, the forecast was toward the front straight on average, uh, but the observed drift actually was quite a bit faster. And this, this late winter spring drift here was extraordinarily fast. And, and it was kind of the uncertainties that we provided that was like marginally still captured and almost out of bounds. Uh, but in the end, it was captured again. So after 120 days, it was just still within the uncertainty uh, that we provided with our product based on the ensemble spread. Okay, so this was quite um, successful in this case. Now, this is averaged over the whole mosaic time, only for mosaic, uh, for the different systems we have. And so now if you are linked with one of the other systems, you, you can see where you find uh, yourself here in this plot. Um, and uh, what I want to highlight just here, so, so these up here, in particular the black here. So the black here is location persistence. So we definitely want to outperform that. We also have here in gray a drift persistence where you where you do as if you would drift, continue to drift as you have been drifting over the past 24 hours. And clearly the systems outperform such simple benchmarks. And, and most importantly, the consensus uh, outperforms each of the individual systems. So that is really, um, that is really positive. And, and, and that is why we also have been using the consensus for uh, quite some campaign support, as I will show uh, in a moment. Um, beyond just uh, error, so how far uh, have the observations been relative to a forecast, what we also wanted to look into is whether the forecast systems are able to forecast such a thing as sea ice deformation. And, and for that, um, we also targeted the distributed network uh, of Mosaic, the distributed network of buoys. And so now here uh, on, on this plot, we see just for six of those buoys, um, the difference between two subsequent days in black November 17th and red uh, November 18th. And, and from the individual forecast for those different targets, of course, you can derive a deformation of the array. And then you can see whether the deformation in the forecasts and the deformation in the observations have anything in common. So is there deformation forecast skill in, in these forecast products? And this is an analysis that uh, Valentin Ludwig uh, in my group has been doing and is still uh, doing. So this is preliminary results. Um, now we're looking at just this one subset of buoys here. 
which is the earlier part of the mosaic drift. And, and to cut a long story short, um, really this is just for one model and one set of buoys, but for this relatively small scale, so we're talking about 50 kilometers diameter here, we see very low correlation uh, between the forecasted uh, deformation and, and the actually observed deformation. Um, and also for other deformation parameters, we're finding this and for other models. And uh, so what we think uh, is happening here is that, um, that this smaller scale deformation, which is really impacted a lot by where exactly a lead is opening or not, uh, so that, that this is kind of dominated thereby by kind of noise which is driven by whether there is a lead or not somewhere. And uh, so what we're trying at the moment is to, to go to larger and larger scales by also using uh, more clearly separated uh, buoys in, in certain arrays and in order to find at which scale does the deformation forecast of the forecast systems start to really capture what is going on in the observed deformation. Um, now, uh, lastly, I want to uh, show some use cases, and as, as I mentioned already, we used the consensus forecasts uh, for the satellite image ordering. So this is a TerraSAR X animation of the mosaic floor, uh, flow, um, and this has been based on the SITVEX consensus forecast, so this is TerraSAR X. And, and what uh, Suman Singa um, said is, because of SITFEX, our hitting rate was about 80 to 85 percent. Without SITFEX, my expectation was below 50 percent. So uh, I think this is really a cool result. Um, another use case, so uh, for the Endurance 2020 expedition, and, and some of you uh, may have uh, heard that Endurance 22, uh, that, uh, that the Endurance, so Shackleton's ship, has been found in the Weddell Sea of this uh, famous expedition by uh, Shackleton. And, and this is also something where we as SIDFEX contributed with our consensus forecasts and there are also Lasse Rabenstein and his team. They uh, have heavily made use of our consensus forecasts. Um, and it is really beautiful. So there are some videos. If you haven't seen this, then maybe you should uh, search for it in, on the web because there are really some nice uh, videos showing uh, the remnants of the endurance. Um, there has been an expedition going on the last couple of weeks where uh, Simon Reifenberg has been on board and they have used the forecast as well. I don't know the details yet and I'm looking forward to get a report from Simon sometime very soon. Um, there was another expedition by IODP, a very exciting one I must say from a uh, CI's forecasting perspective, scheduled uh, because they wanted to drill into the Arctic Ocean in a region where there can still be ice. So they have to do ice management and in order to do ice management with icebreakers uh, so that the, the coring vessel uh, can do its job, they must know where the ice is going to come from so that they know which ice they need to uh, cut into small pieces. So this is really uh, a very interesting case. Unfortunately, this expedition should have been going on right now, but uh, for political, rather obvious reasons, this needed to be postponed to we don't know when. And uh, I'm coming to the end of my presentation, so um, w the look into the future. So we still want to uh, support campaigns that might be upcoming. We want to do more in-depth analyses, so there's clearly also some, some scope for more analyses. At least two papers are in the making uh, out of uh, SITFEX, and these are long overdue, and there's quite a re responsibility on my personal part, I must admit, to, uh, to make that happen rapidly. Um, we are working on an update for the web tool. Um, for all of this, also, we have this BMBF project SITFEX Explorer ongoing until October 2023. So until then, the legacy is kind of in, in, in funded hands. Beyond that, we need to see, and for anything else, we need to urgently have another SITFEX meeting, and I will email everyone about that very soon. And last but not least, I want to acknowledge um, the, the team at AVI um, working with me on the SITFEX-related matters, which is Simon uh, and Valentin, which I already mentioned, and also Antonia Joost, uh, who's a student working with us uh, in particular on this web tool update. So thanks, everyone, for your attention, and um, if there is any time, I would be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much for that, Helge. It was, it was great to see all of the work that's, that's been going on in SIDFAX and just, uh, you know, what a focal point it's been for, for the community of CIS forecasting to, to get involved. Um, so do we have uh, some, some questions uh, in the room? Here, Bruno at the back, please come up to the mic.
Hi, and thanks for your talk. Uh, <coughs> which rheology of sea ice were you using when you were comparing the formation at this small scale with the buoy array? And have you considered using maybe a discrete element or other form or like maybe SPH or, and then like more like the continuum rheology? Yeah, so actually, I mean, um, this analysis, which is still ongoing, is uh, so we are doing this for all the systems that are providing forecasts for us. Uh, by, by the way, do you hear me well? We yeah, do. I do. do. Yeah. yeah, OK. Um, yeah, so um, this really depends on the systems that are sending over forecasts. So um, as far as I know, uh, none of them has uh, such a thing like, you know, uh, elastopital rheology or these these things. So these. I, I, I would think most of them are probably EP, uh, EVP and uh, VP, although that's, this is really, um, yeah, probably I would need to, we would need to ask the individual uh, contributors what rheology exact, exactly is behind this. But um, I mean, this result was, so what we have seen so far is really that this is, uh, cuts through uh, all the different rheologies. And also, you know, as long as you don't have something in place that initializes your leads at the correct place, I think it would not really matter uh, if you have a very, even if you have a very sophisticated um, rheology that can, in principle, uh, do this in a very proper way. You will, you know, you will have a really hard time placing the leads at the right locations, right? Um, I agree. So, so, right. So, whether or not you have a lead at the right time in the right place. You, you will still have a hard time. No, so, I agree. Um, I, I don't think we can do that, but I was more uh, referring to different uh, numerical framework, like um, discrete versus uh, finite difference, as opposed to yeah, yeah, yeah. EVP, yeah, yeah. VP, and uh, MEB, more like a numerical framework. Yeah. So, no, I mean, these are um, like the, I, like the, we don't have a discrete uh, model uh, in okay. here. Yeah. Thanks. Helge, I mean, maybe a question for me. So I was wondering, I mean, you've been doing all this work. A lot of it was live for support of Mosaic. But now, you know, that we're kind of coming to the end of that, I mean, is there still a possibility for groups with, say, models like, like those Bruno was mentioning to go back and rerun over the past and contribute? Because I know, for example, there was a, a sea ice rheology uh, intercomparison called Cyrex. Um, and so it'd be interesting to be able to cross-reference from the different models that contributed there to what was done in SIDFEX and to see if that can help to untangle a little bit some of the differences. No, there is definitely scope also to have more groups still joining in and rerunning. Also, other, I mean, many of the groups that are uh, taking uh, part, they have rerun, for example, when they entered SIDFEX uh, at, at a certain point in time, they also fill, backfilled uh, later forecasts, so to speak. So to speak. Now, when it, when it comes to the sea ice rheology experiment, I think um, one issue would be that I, I think most models there, they they run with atmospheric forcing provided, right? So they are not really forecast that, you, you know, it, it would be a quite different thing because they have the correct atmospheric forcing. So it, it's not like uh, when we do this in real time, we have systems that really run blindly into the future. So they don't have the luxury of having the correct reanalysis forcing already from the atmosphere driving things. So. Um, I think having those included would open somewhat a new can. Um, yeah, but uh, I mean, it's an interesting thought how we can better link um, in that direction also, yeah. Okay, thanks. I think we're gonna have to move on, but uh, let's thank Helge again. Thank you everyone, and I'm sad not to be with you. Bye Helge. Um, all right.